Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Room Now podcast. It's September 15th, 2023. Another special edition, this time with Dr. Peter Nash. Peter, how are you? Excellent, Jack. Lovely to talk to you from way down under. Way down under in Brisbane. Is that, they say it right? Brisbane? Brisbane, you say. Oh, Brisbane. Well, no, but I know that's what I would say. I'm from Brooklyn. I would say Brisbane. <laughs> You know, yeah, we're Brisbane. We're Brisbane. <laughs> we screw. Uh, we find all kinds of ways to screw it up. So, um, this is a great uh, opportunity. You know, just any time I spend with Peter is fabulous. We love to um, uh, argue. We love to teach. We have our views. We're not shy about that. So, we're going to sort of review the news and see where this goes. So, Peter, my first um, report from today is a little bit. I'm, you know, I've shied away from doing COVID. Uh, abstracts and reports because it was just so much much of that for so long but it still continues to be relevant in our specialty with some other reports and this is a little bit of a throwback but this is a study of 159 patients who were COVID infected and compared to 73 healthy controls these are not autoimmune patients these are just COVIDs and normals and a wide battery of tests was done to look at um, you know, sort of some cellular differences and humoral differences. And they came up with this idea that, that autoantibodies were much more common as everyone gets older. That's not surprising, but it was even higher when you were infected with SARS-CoV-2, especially those who had the more severe infections. Notably, the autoantibodies that were particularly elevated in these COVID-infected individuals were patients who had anti-cardiolipin and antiplatelet glycoprotein autoantibodies. Um, and it fits nicely into one, what we saw, you know, during COVID that, that this was one of the reasons why patients did badly was that they were getting thrombotic events. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of talk about <laughs> why they get them. And it was these autoantibodies and gee, who knows something about these autoantibodies? Shouldn't we call Dr. Nash? Uh, <laughs> what do you think about this data? Well, look, it's very interesting. And like you said, this COVID thing is not going away anytime soon. We're now seeing the tail of long COVID and we're going to have to manage all those patients with uh, symptoms that persist for a long period of time. Like you, we saw a lot of patients with autoimmune disease aggravated by the vaccine. And now we're looking at some autoantibody production related to the infection itself. Mm -hmm. Now, the anti-vaxxers have been in my ear about microthrombi caused by the vaccine. Mm. So I emailed the authors of this study and said, all these patients with these autoantibodies, can you just reassure me about their vaccination status? Because I'd love to know that the controls and the infected people had nothing to do with vaccination, which would be very helpful. That whole anti-vax movement is claiming sudden death in young athletes from microthrombi and they blame vaccine, they don't blame COVID. And this is very nice evidence that maybe they should be blaming COVID infection rather than the vaccine. Yeah. I was I was fascinated by those people who got who got really severe thrombocytopenia right. suddenly. Right. And small number, but you know, I thought when I looked into it, antiplatelet factor four antibodies was associated with the precipitous drop in platelets. And my sneaking suspicion is that these people had heparin for some completely unrelated illness 10, 20 years ago, developed some antibodies, and it was like a second hit problem. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of these unknowns that you don't get necessarily in, in these sort of small population cohorts. Um, the good news is they're all from the same place. I would have expected that the healthy controls... And the COVID patients kind of have the same degree of vaccination history in these blood draws that happened long after the, you know, the March of 2020 when COVID began. But um, I, it, it's all, I, you're right. There's a, still a lot of buzz about that it's not just the infection. It could well be the vaccination that's a problem. I'm still recommending to my patients, go ahead, get the vaccine. The new the new version just came out. I'm going to get it. Um I spoke to a patient today who unfortunately just just received uh, her second dose of rituximab, and she's got to wait until you know January, February before she can get her influenza and her rituximab. I mean, are I'm, you seeing 
and COVID. Are you seeing the new variant in the U.S.? Uh, yes, but again, the numbers are really small. Like it's been, you know, if you follow that, you'll see the numbers are really, really small uh, as far as the blip on the uh, on the on the graph. But they are up, you know, uh, anywhere from seven to fifteen percent in different areas of the United States and also worldwide. And it's gonna. But you know what happens if there's a a surge in this stuff in in the middle of America, it's going to find its way to the coast or vice versa. And then overseas, again, what goes around comes around kind of deal. Um, so I, I think you're right. Um, I don't wear masks when I go out and go to most places. But when I'm getting on a plane and going through airport security and big crowds, I'm wearing a mask now. And uh, I think it's the prudent thing to do because I just, it's not going to go away um, entirely. And I'm going to get the next vaccine as it's actually available right now i got a notice this week so um i would recommend everyone to do the same but everyone wants this thing to go away it's unfortunately yeah. it's not going to be that easy but it's interesting our patients are now coming to terms with a yearly flu shot a yearly covid shot um and we're a little bit more aggressive now with vaccination right. um luckily shindrick's just been approved by our government for everybody over the age of 18 who are immunocompromised nice so they're they're paying for that vaccine for that population, which is a big advance for us. But we're trying to get the vaccination thing covered and covered early in the course of disease before it becomes an issue. Yeah, I think that rheumatologists are going to have to be very proactive about the vaccine strategy that's going on in, in their patients. And, you know, uh, in your quest to get them under control, which may mean changing to, you know, um, your third and fourth choice and your unconventional choices and and your zeal to get them under control, you've got to consider how what's the timing here and is there, a, again, the sicker they are, the more they really need the influenza yeah. and the COVID vaccine, right? We find the only practical way is to give it to their nurse, nurse practitioner and a checklist because she'll make sure it gets done. If you leave it to us, it'll never get done. Yeah, well... <laughs> is that really true i we don't want to admit it, but you're spot on there dr nash um you're going to like this next study which is um it's about cardiovascular risk in lupus and ra patients it's a really large cohort study patient that looks at um you know how many days they're on their anti-malarial drug um do i have that down here uh no um and yeah i do i have to right here so it's uh, 16,000 RA and lupus patients, um, and they are all on an anti-malarial drug, mainly hydroxychloroquine. The incidence of cardiovascular events overall was 13%. The bottom line is when they looked at adherence to um, the anti-malarial, it dropped these cardiovascular events 28% overall what's this 38 percent mi drop uh 65 percent drop in strokes and a 35 percent drop in vtes so again this idea that you know uh, there was a time i said this week i gave a lecture and i was saying i, I gave a, a lecture a number of years ago in san diego where i i said stop screwing around with hydroxychloroquine in ra it's a it's a weak drug yeah it's safe and it's great and it, you know may have some additive effect but honestly to rely on it is a big mistake. And I got booed. I got booed by an audience <laughs> of, of 50 of my peers. And um, and I, you know what? I think that they were right in retrospect. Um, I was a little harsh on hydroxychloroquine, I think. Uh, it, is, it should be vitamin H and RA, just like it's vitamin H and SLE. What, what do you, what's your take? I agree. I think we call it vitamin P for Plaquenil and every lupus patient has to be on it. And with the rheumatoid, see, for in our regime that we work under, you have to have failed two conventional synthetics, including methotrexate, to be eligible for a biologic. So Plaquenil is the automatic one that we commence with. Evidence now in cardiovascular risk, diabetes risk, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's usually very well tolerated. It reminds me of that GARG paper from um, Philadelphia ACR, where... First of all, I wasn't completely aware that it was so dependent on renal excretion and be careful with people with poor renal function. Right. But she 
very nice to where she measured levels. And to be honest, I've never measured a hydroxychloroquine level in my life. And she showed that if you can show a level over 500, the patient is actually taking the plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. If you can get a level over 750, 67, 750 nanograms per mil, 67% less flares. Right. And if they're over 1,500 because of renal impairment, they're going to get toxicity. So, you know, maybe we should measure the occasional hydroxychloroquine level and make sure they're adhering and make sure we're reducing flares. You know, I think that there's so much of what you're saying is so true. I, I remember a meeting in Madrid uh, where Michelle Petrie first presented this hydroxychloroquine blood levels, and she was mainly advocating for it uh, as a tool to show compliance in the beginning and she but she was concerned that it might actually have utility in in predicting efficacy and less flares as you as you suggest and honestly that's really what's panned out and then all this there's a lot of data about hydroxychloroquine in ra there's no reason we couldn't also do levels in ra one to show compliance um and to also hit targets and the downstream effects are great there's, you know, everything from, you know, diabetes control, antithrombotic effects, anti-diabetic effects, um, maybe even less hospitalizations. You know, I, when you started that patient with new RA on methotrexate hydroxychloroquine to meet the standard so that you could move on, uh, you know, moving on would usually mean for me, probably keeping them on methotrexate and stopping hydroxychloroquine. I don't know that we should do that. You know, well, I it's certainly looking like we shouldn't, shouldn't it? But I think it just helps us get that disease activity under control and inflammation is probably the thing that drives risk the most and less likely to need steroids, it drives risk, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I was listening to one of your podcasts the other day talking about statins, and I really think we should be the one that gets stuck into these risk factors. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's um, room, rooms are quick to use the multimorbidity story as a reason why patients got to be aggressive and take medicines and come back to see me and this stuff is good for you but we're not so quick to take responsibility for the statins i got a really great letter from a fellow aussie i'm going to publish i hope about how he does this and basically you know he orders the test and once he orders the test you know on lipid levels then he's kind of locked into you know starting the process you know and uh, and something that we should consider both, you know, for hypertension management, statin management, uh, lipid management, weight management, really, you know, any of the comorbidities, diabetes for that matter, um, we should probably be, have a little bit more involvement because your problem is your doctors think you're the smartest and best doctor of all of them. And you're the only one they're probably going to really follow up with. Well, they think if the fancy specialist didn't think it was important enough to do, why should I bother? And I, and I just think that we those bloods come across our desk every month. We see them. It, it, we, we really should commence and then involve the general practitioner to follow up, and we keep an eye on it as well. Absolutely. All right, so um, this is an interesting report about um, life expectancy in a um, large cohort of AS patients. This was a this study basically showed, um, and I, I didn't write down the numbers of how many people, but it was fairly large um, and kind of population-based, but they showed that AS and not non-radiographic axial spa had significant shortened life expectancy. And I think that that's not necessarily a new um, story. Um, that, However, what was, I thought, novel here was that the mortality was higher in people who are B27 positive and especially in B27 positive women. So again, that, that's a 37% higher mortality than the general population. Um, and, but it didn't pan out so much for the, again, for the non-radiographic axial spot. In fact, they had even, a, they had a, a, a longer life expectancy that was significant. So, um, you know, what does this tell us about what we should be doing or what we're not doing in spondyloarthritis? This is a tricky paper to have a look at. Um, they started in 85 and followed them up to 2019. And the numbers of the non-radiographic are quite small. And again, there were some queries about the diagnosis, but what what in, in some of them, but what really struck home was it was the B27 positives that, that showed this loss of um, life expectancy, which was something that I wasn't aware of. 
Um, they don't comment on whether treatment makes any impact on right. survival. Right. Uh, so there's lots of lots of ways you could you could look at this and say, hey, we better check on this and check on that. But I think it's an interesting observation, and and uh, really it's hypothesis generating because now people have got to go out and find out what it is it that changes that life expectancy. And whenever I see relative risks, you know, what's the absolute risk difference? And I tried to look it up and in the A, tried to work it out. I mean, in the AS, the absolute difference was about um, 9%. So you only have to treat 11 people and you protect one mm -hmm. um, potentially. And the absolute risk for the AXPAR group was 4%. So you might have to treat 25 to, to save one. But hypothesis generating, please go and see what are those risk factors that come with the B27 that drive this result. But and I, and I agree with that. This is not necessarily going to change a, a guideline or a paradigm per se. Um, it's a head scratcher and it should be studied further. One thing that that shines through on this study that we have talked about uh, in our TREG um, educational things that, again, women don't do so well. We know the story about women with uh, spondylitis not presenting the same, having more pain, not doing well. And uh, all this recent data, both in PSA and SPA, about women not responding well um, compared to men. And now it's not just that, oh, well, women have more pain. Um, it's, I mean, they have less survival here. Um, yeah. how, how do you, do, uh, with all that data that's come through about women not doing so well in the spondyloarthropathies, has it changed the way you treat women with spondyloarthritis or, or PSA? Well, I certainly think that across the XBAR spectrum, they should now stratify the baseline for gender for every trial moving forward. Mm -hmm. And and has got a huge project underway looking at gender and trying to explain these differences. Is it hormonal? Is it response to therapy? Is it the therapy they're given? Is it late diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. This particular study was all plain x-ray. It was long before the days of MRI. So we really don't know how many of these patients actually had, you know, active involvement in spine or some x-ray changes or what they relied on new york criteria for diagnosis for example so look i think i don't understand um other than incorrect diagnosis because that's now one of the recommendations from the eula guidelines please reassess the diagnosis if they're not responding right. and i think it's a very reasonable thing to say right. and again how many of these women actually had active inflammatory disease but that won't change life expectancy. So there is an unknown there that, I, that I'm trying to get my head around. Right. And it, it, we do need more research and insights and maybe another a better approach. Um, so our next has to do with RA again and extra articular manifestation. So there were two papers recently. There was a Brazilian paper I didn't publish. It was a thousand patients, kind of showed the same kind of numbers that the extra articular manifestation, if you conclude all of them, not just the ones you worry about, vasculitis, felties, you know, monoritis, the multiplex, the things we don't see much anymore, but all of them, including nodules, this particular study of 900 patients from the Mayo Clinic looked at two different years, 85 to 2000 and 2000 to 2015, 15-year periods, and the 10-year total cumulative incidence of any extra articular manifestation dropped from a high in the first era of 45%, to a significant drop to 32% in the second era. They showed that most of that drop was related to uh, the uh, greatest decline in subcutaneous nodules, 31% going down to 16%, but also a significant drop in non-severe RA, which was 41% um, uh, down to 29%. So the risk factors that they found here was, uh, not surprising, rheumatoid factor, um, again, they weren't checking CCP back in the early days, so they don't factor that in. Uh, and smoking, things that we've known from the past. So um, this is all encouraging. Um, and I still do see nodules, but I don't see much of that really scary extra articular manifestations. Should the average rheumatologist be concerned with this data? Because again, what they showed in many studies, including this Brazilian study, is that the patients with extra articular manifestations did have worse disease by all measures. CDI, DAS, uh, HACK, et cetera. Well, uh, like this study, we just don't see like we used to. I can't remember the last 
rheumatoid vasculitis I saw. I can't remember the last really, you know, nodulosis. I think I see more methotrexate-induced tiny nodules around fingers than I see the uh, big, ugly elbow olecranon nodules. I think it reflects that we're either treating early, which which must be we over-treat some people, um, and we're controlling inflammation. They're just not getting these extra articular manifestations as much. Interesting, I don't think Sjogren's has changed much. We still see a lot of Sjogren's uh, in our rheumatoid population, um, and I don't think that's dropped off. Rheumatoid lung disease, I think I'm seeing less. Methotrexate, I hardly ever see any issue with methotrexate and lung. I think it's the most overdiagnosed right. combination on the, right. on the planet. Um, so I think it's reassuring. And if you look at, I think um, one of the publications showed that the baseline swollen joint count to get into RA trials has dropped significantly over the years from a baseline of 20 when the TNF started. Now they're getting six or eight or 10 um, to get into a trial. So the whole disease has changed over time, herd immunity or treatment effects. Yeah, uh, I think that's absolutely true. I, I I must say about 10 years ago, I was trying to put together a, a little bit of a slide progression about that RA is getting milder and it wasn't quite so easy now. I think data is starting to pile up, especially if you just even look at baseline inclusion numbers uh, on clinical trials and just map that out. That's where, that's an eye opener, because you know back when we were doing trials in the in, in the nineties and two thousands, you're right. You know, thirty six tender joints, fifteen swollen joints. Those are the means going in. Um, those numbers have dropped quite a bit. So quite a lot. Yeah. So this week, uh, Peter, on um, we had a Tuesday night rheumatology webinar. It was a really interesting discussion. It was about early RA referral of disease, treatment of early RA. Considerations on preclinical RA. We had um, Marty Bergman, um, Glenn Hazelwood from Calgary, and Vivian Bykirk from uh, Special Surgery in New York, and we we reviewed some data and some some papers, and we had a lively discussion. I, I want to get your take on a few things. You know, where do you stand on early RA? What I took from the survey of over two hundred U.S. rheumatologists, well, actually worldwide rheumatologists, not much difference between the U.S. and 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 even Australia was we all want to see early RA, but we really don't see early RA. Um, it's still a rare event as a new intake patient. And we almost never see people with less than six weeks of symptoms. We always see people with three, six, 12 months of symptoms when we get them. So we all talk about, we want to see early RA and we want to start early DMARDs, but we do nothing to get them into our care. What's your thoughts on this and how should we proceed? I did have a listen to that podcast as, as well. It was very good. Look, uh, in the Australian setting, we have to be a little careful, particularly in the seronegatives, and we should have a discussion about seronegatives at some future event because I think RA should be renamed ACPA positive arthritis and the others, yeah. just like ACPA positive vasculitis yeah. and the others, because Brilliant. there's a, many reasons why that might be helpful. But anyway, so. We are full of viral arthritis. We get Ross River fever, Barma forest, Sinbis, Gitter. We get through summer, we get hundreds of patients with viral arthritis, and it can look like anything right. hot monarthritis, all tendons and tenosynovitis, all polyarthritis. So they come in with a viral thing. We think it's rheumatoid. We start, the minute you talk rheumatoid for us, and we're convinced that's what it is, methotrexate, folic acid, hydroxychloroquine, low-dose prednisone, and they walk out the door. So we're fairly aggressive from day one. That's why we agonize over the diagnosis. So if someone comes back better, it's our pills that did it, not that it was a viral thing was going to go away by itself. And then they're committed to stay on that stuff for a while. So... I, we just a touch more careful, particularly in the seronegative space. But just like you, you give a talk on ma modern management of RA and you say, we've got to get these DMARDs in fast. And the guy puts his hand up at the back of the room and said, who are you kidding? We can't even get in for 100 days. So what we do, we fax in. So like Canada, we're referral practice. It has to go through a GP. You can't walk through the door and say, I've heard Jack Cush is the best in Dallas and I want in. So 
um, the GPs that get GP education about the, the new therapies, they're all very interested in the new therapies. They don't want to manage them. They just want to have heard about them and the safety aspects because yeah. the patient will ring them at three o'clock in the morning. They won't ring me. So they need to know something. All referrals are faxed in and we triage them. If you've got a stiff neck and a bad back, you'll wait. If you've got a hot inflammatory stuff, you'll see him within seven to 10 days. And luckily I've got a group practice and one of the six of us can fit them in um, within that time frame, and we try and get things going. So we do that. <clears throat> GPs are pretty good at doing bloods and things. We don't mandate it. The public hospital mandates a list of tests that have to be done before the patient can be seen. We don't mandate that, but the GPs are pretty good at doing tests. And, um, you know, we often find, you know, we're, we're dealing with a weekly positive rheumatoid factor for somebody who doesn't have rheumatoid, but the test has been done by the GP and they don't know what to do with the result. Right. So the answer to your question is triage, facts in the referrals, and see the inflammatory ones. We did an audit the other day. We see 85% inflammatory and 15% cold, if you like. Oh. And that's good. But we... We've got a sports doc, we've got a shoulder clinic, we've got a bone clinic. So, you know, it's pretty, I think wherever there's a manpower issue like we have, the GPs are very savvy. They know what you can offer and what the next guy can't. And so they send you the stuff that you can offer. And that, you know, there's the orthopods, there's the musculoskeletal docs, and there's us and the pain guys and they're pretty switched on to anything inflammatory comes this way. Anything that needs an operation goes that way. Yeah. I mean, I think your recommendations are strong and play people, clinics, locations that have a plan manage us so much better than the rest of us. We're just looking to fill our clinic and we're not, we're not seeing 85% inflammatory arthritis. We're seeing 85% non-inflammatory arthritis, but our schedules are full. We could do better. Um, the other big thing about the session was we had a, a, a little bit of a go round about um, preclinical RA. Um, and when we surveyed rheumatologists, um, what we found was they are largely looking for rules. They, 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 there's a lot of confusion about what the rules are. I don't know what the rules are to treat someone aggressively or to treat someone symptomatically. And hence, most people are, are not using speci any specific therapy. They're basically um, waiting setting up a follow-up appointment and retesting them. I don't know why they're retesting them, but, you know, I guess maybe they could turn, turn positive at some point if they were zero negative. But, you know, a, a lot of what's going on here is based on what's not known. And yet plenty is known. Look, one of our problems is my day is full of well people on biologics repeating the script and getting their paperwork done again. What do you do in the U.S.? Like, I'll... Uh, you know, my nurse practitioner is not allowed to prescribe. I've got to do this paperwork every six months. And over time, the number of people you see just for paperwork increase, increase, increase. How often should we see a biologic patient? Six monthly, 12 monthly, only when they've got a problem. What do you do with these people? You know, in your day, I might have 10 or 15 patients who really don't need to be there. A nurse practitioner could handle it quite adequately and get me if there's a problem, but we're supposed to see them every six months to do their paperwork, check them out, check their bloods, make sure they're okay when they're well. So how do you manage it overseas? Well, I think it's variably managed. I think everyone is still built on the model of, you know, a periodicity to follow up. It's either every three or every six, unless you're a mess. And you're seeing more frequently, but the documentation of that, or, or the de you know, proving that that's the cost-effective way, is a little fast and loose. Next week on Tuesday Night Rheumatology, Mike Weinblatt wants to discuss you know this idea of maybe doing less monitoring with methotrexate. He's very much against it. Yet there's papers out there that say we probably do too much monitoring. So in the U.S., we can have clinics run by NPs and PAs who can write for biologics. And that, that is, um, a, I think, a very smart move. But you have to be able, you have to be smart about, especially your follow-up care, if you want to create space for these new patients who need to be seen. That's the real, that's the gigantic challenge. Um, and most of us really don't have a plan, but there are, it's a lot of good 
um, plans out there. Eric Newman at the Geisinger Clinic, you know, uh, has, you know, a proposal that we've talked about at Room Now Live in the past. And and I think that you can be much smarter. But the idea is you got, you got to create the opportunity. You have to, most people believe, uh, I'll see patients when, if a doctor calls me, I'll find a way. But the doctor's never going to call because I don't advertise who I want to see. So um, it's a, it, this is a struggle. You're, you're right. If, you're, if your schedule is 100% filled with paperwork, well, therein lies a gigantic problem for all of us. Hopefully, okay. AI will fix that and we'll have a bot who will do, do that in for those, those tasks for us in the future and freeing up you to do the things that you do best. All right. So preclinical RI. So... You know, we've we've talked about all the studies, your Batisep studies, the uh, Ritux study. Ritux was one dose. I mean, what did they expect that it wasn't going to come back, you know, if you have one dose? So, um, and again, this is, and the some of the studies, I think they've all, they've really got early RA. They're active positive with synovitis in two joints. I mean, if that's not RA, what is? Right. So, so I, I think that, um we are fairly aggressive, but we need some objective evidence of synovitis, whether we use a bit of imaging at that stage, whether we use an acute phase reactant, whether we use clinical judgment, but we're prepared to reassess and reconsider the diagnosis down the line, especially if there's, you know, everything's vanished and et cetera, et cetera, you know? So I think that we probably do tend to over-treat some, mainly because of this viral thing that we have, particularly the zero negatives we've got to be careful but we we like to to get in and treat early but we need some objective evidence because of the commitment to you know this and that and the other you go from having no pills one day to six or eight a day after that so you know it's an issue yeah i, I first off i think the decision about whether or not to initiate therapy in a preclinical RA is not as hard as we make it out to be. It's a ratchet effect. Like you said, we look at that those studies and a lot of them we say, gee, it looks like RA to me, even though it didn't meet ACR criteria. Um, why are we not calling that RA? And, and I think clearly when you have these additive, you know, uh, signs of RA, let's just call it RA and treat it. And what's wrong with overtreating RA? I mean, I I would rather be accused uh, accused of overtreating RA than undertreating RA. That would be, you know, quite an insult to my, you know, my uh, my training and and what I I think is important. So, um, especially prepared to revisit the diagnosis down the line. Right, that's right, and and especially the ones you really have to worry about are the ones you already talked about, and that's the serum negatives. They're the ones who you know carry this cloud of uncertainty that you should always be reassessing them. So. All right, Peter, this has been fabulous. I want to remind the audience next week on Tuesday Night Rheumatology, um, uh, the 19th of September, methotrexate decision-making led by, uh, discussion led by Drs. Weinblatt and Kremer um, and, and a few others. I think you're going to really enjoy that. Peter, delight to have you on. It's always, uh, we've got to do this again. Lovely, Jack. Nice to talk to you. Stay well. Yep. Okay, folks. Enjoy. Bye-bye.